Welcome to Banyan's Faith and Recovery Radio Show. I'm your host, Anthony Akinfora. I'm also the director and chaplain at Banyan Treatment Center's Faith and Recovery Program. The Faith and Recovery Program is a faith-based drug and alcohol treatment program. It's part of Banyan Treatment Center. It's in Papano Beach, Florida. It's a non-denominational program designed to allow clients to establish or restore their faith in God while addressing their addiction. We have a very special guest on today, and she's here in studio. Uh, I want to introduce her now. We have with us today Dr. Sharon Mullane. Uh, Dr. Mullane holds a PhD in criminal justice and a law degree, master's in science in criminal justice, bachelor's of science in criminal justice. She has served as a prosecuting attorney in Broward County for 23 years. Wow. Uh, while at the Broward County State's Attorney's Office, she's handled approximately 100, 100 jury trials. In 2007, she began to practice criminal defense law as well. That's interesting. While practicing criminal defense, uh, she started teaching at Kaiser University, where she has been for the past 11 years. She also teaches in the graduate program at Liberty University. Dr. Mullane's specialty track in her PhD in criminal justice was behavioral science. Uh, her dissertation was on preparedness of local police to combat terrorism. And her research focuses, uh, remains on terrorism, Sharia law, and crime associated with those immigrating into the United States, both legally and illegally. Man, that's a lot. That, and that's the abbreviated version. I had to cut it down a little bit or we would have probably uh, went into half of, the, half of the show here. Amazing accomplishments. And it's just such an interesting background to be a prosecutor and a defense attorney. I know I, a few of them, but not many. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. So I want to welcome her to the show now. Here she is, Dr. Sharon Mullane. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for, for coming down, taking the time to do this. I know you are extremely busy uh, with, with uh, teaching and, and all the other things that, that you're involved in. Let me ask you, uh, tell our listeners, what, what's motivated you to become a prosecutor? And tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, I suppose um, when I left law school, uh, I was looking for an opportunity where I could help victims, uh, where I could at the same time get trial experience uh, and move along with my career while helping people at the same time. And that's what motivated me initially to want to become a prosecuting attorney. Great. Wow. That's, uh, you've, had some, you've had some big cases, some major cases. Uh, why don't you tell us about... So, what was one of the most difficult cases that you had? Well, I've had many difficult cases. I suppose some of the most difficult cases, uh, in looking back, have to do uh, with cases where we ended up prosecuting the wrong person for a crime. Mm, yeah. And of course, uh, in some countries, that might not be meaningful. In our country, um, we uh, look, we frown upon prosecuting the wrong person for a crime he or she did not commit. So I've had a couple of different cases, two or three different cases that come to mind, where um, we had four or five uh, ID witnesses who positively identified this particular man as committing the crime. Uh, one I recall was a firearm robbery uh, and a very serious case. Uh, the other case had to do with a man going up to a victim and blowing his arm off with a gun. And in, in both of those cases, um, we had at least four positive IDs that this is the man who committed the crime. And when you've got that many positive IDs from different people, you tend to think you have a pretty strong case. And in both of those cases, it turned out that we had the wrong person. Oh, boy. So, so what happens? I mean, I, wa I watch a lot of 48 Hours and like Dateline, and I love those shows because mm -hmm. Because it's interesting how they, they lay it out and you think it's going to be one person and it's like, oh yeah, this guy's definitely guilty. And then it'll take a twist and it's like, no, that's not him at all. And, and then at the end, it all kind of comes to an end and you figure out what happened. But what, what happens with that when, you know, if you, if you stumble across something as a prosecutor that would help the defense, 
Is that something, that, I mean, you have to immediately identify that, right? Or report mm -hmm. that, or I'm sure there's, sometimes that doesn't happen. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe somebody could rationalize or justify why they wouldn't think that they have to say anything about this. I don't know, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, a prosecutor is bound by oath mm. uh, to reveal anything to the defense that could be beneficial to the defense. Uh, that's one thing we have to always consider as prosecuting attorneys. Uh, the next thing we have to think about is the prosecutor's oath. The prosecutor's oath is not merely to prosecute, but is to seek justice. Right. So wherever that justice falls, whichever side of the fence it falls on, that's where we should be because we need to follow that oath of seeking justice. And it would certainly not be just to prosecute the wrong person for an offense. Right, right, so, so that's, that's interesting. So tell us a little bit about the, you know, what are some of the significant contrasts between being a prosecutor, because you're on both ends of this, which is very unique, I, I think, uh, you know, being a prosecutor and then being a defense attorney. And I'm sure you, it gave you an advantage as being a defense attorney because you were so familiar with what the prosecution does and, and how that works. But what, what, are, what are some of the contrasts there? What, are, what were some things that were you know, interesting about you know, being, being in those two roles? Mm -hmm. Well, you're definitely right, um, Anthony, because uh, you know, it's, it's definitely interesting on, on both sides of the fence. And um, what I learned as a prosecuting attorney during those 23 years helped me to be successful as a criminal defense attorney. Uh, and going back to seeking justice, the two main things that we have to look at as a prosecutor, you're seeking justice, you're prosecuting on behalf of victims. Uh, and many people have asked me, well, gee, how can you be a defense attorney? Well, it's fairly simple because as a criminal defense attorney, you are taking the laws uh, which uh, uh, you are trying to then use to the benefit of your client. Um, the result may be um, for someone who has committed a premeditated murder in the first degree, the result may be uh, that a defense attorney accomplishes is uh, preventing that person from um, going to the death penalty in a state like Florida. Uh, resulting in that person perhaps doing a life in prison instead of the death penalty. That might be a good result in a certain mm -hmm. case. Yeah. Um, so we have to think about those types of things and, and just once again as a criminal defense attorney, just using the law as it exists to do the best thing you can do in representing your client. Right. Uh, we're going to need to take a quick break. Uh, we will be back in 30 seconds. We're here with Dr. Sharon. Uh, McLean, and uh, we'll be right back. Are you struggling with addiction or mental health disorders? Banyan Treatment Center's Faith and Recovery Program helps people at the depths of their despair, spreading the word that recovery is possible through the power of Christ. Cry out to him, where are you, God? Where are you? I don't feel you. Where's your presence? Why are you allowing this to happen? He already knows our thoughts anyway. We might as well just put it out there. Program Director Anthony Ancampuro will help you discover how God can turn your mess into your message. Call Banyan Treatment Center for help now, 888-230-3122. Again, that's 888-230-3122. Welcome back to the Faith and Recovery Radio Show. I'm your host, Anthony Alcantara. We are here with Dr. Sharon Mullane, and she is sharing about uh, her experience uh, as a criminal defense uh, attorney and a prosecutor for Broward County for 23 years, and, and kind of like giving us some insights on, on what goes on there. So it's very interesting. We're so blessed to have her here. She's in studio. And uh, I, I want to shift gears a little bit uh, here. I, I want to ask you about what's the uh, significance of illegal Im immigration with regard to the opiate epidemic in, uh, in America? It's such, a, it's such a huge issue. I know it is for us being in this field, but it's also, I mean, it's, it's basically on the national news every night. It's a huge issue. And uh, I know you, you, with your background in immigration, both legal and illegal, I'd like to get your take on that. How significant do you think it is with, with uh, immigration, with opiates coming in, and just illegal drugs, uh, you know, in general? Well, as we know, it's a tremendous problem with the um, upswing in deaths as a result of opioids mm -hmm. and other drugs. The, the problem 
is just growing day by day. Um, we, as any of the, us who watch the news, know that there is an ongoing problem with border security. Um, sure. We have people coming here illegally. Um, and uh, many of these people, we don't have a firm handle on exactly who they are. Uh, we have people coming here with false IDs. Um, and we have people coming here with many names. And they have one name they give us. Uh, they may have uh, 25 alias. Uh, aliases they use and so um, aside from the fact that we're not always too certain who they are right. we're all also not too certain as their as to their criminal background because not every country keeps the sure. type of records that we keep uh, when it comes to criminal records right. um, if you go to some other countries uh, you will have a great deal of trouble in specific countries um, just finding out who a person is and what their criminal background may be. Uh, another issue is some uh, things that we identify as crimes, some other countries don't identify as crimes. Right. So that's a big problem. And of course, we hear all the time about the, the group MS-13. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a growing challenge. We have, uh, just to give the listeners a little background about them, uh, they were formed in the 1980s in Los Angeles. They, they did not come from another country. They they started out being uh, Salvadorans, but they they originated in Los Angeles in the right. 80s, as I said, uh, and and just continued to grow and grow. We have presently approximately 10,000 or so MS-13 members in the United States. Uh, almost every state is affected. Mm -hmm. um, looking outside the United States, we have. 30,000, could be up to 50,000 or so members of MS-13. Uh, and these people not only have no problems with drugs and, and bringing across drugs and selling drugs, but they take the light in chopping up people with machetes. Right. Uh, they take the light, as we saw just this last weekend, in going into a window with a little girl sleeping and 11 years old and raping her. Um, the, you know, that gives them a, a, a brownie point. Mm. Uh, so that's what we're looking for. Amazing, at. absolutely amazing. You know, I, I don't know what could be more enraging. You know, you have a, a, someone commit a violent crime against you know, one of your family members, one of your loved ones, but then finding out the person was an illegal, you know, immigrant and came in and then was brought back and sent back five, six, seven times. You know, you have that Kate, Kate Steinle uh, situation. I mean, it, it's just, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't understand why people wouldn't want to protect the country and protect their families and things. If you have these people coming in like that, uh, yeah, MS-13, I mean, the, the, this gang, this brutal, brutal gang, and you have people advocating, you know, for them to come in and their rights and, and those types of things. That's very frustrating, and it must be very frustrating from as far as from your standpoint when you were a prosecutor and things like that. You know? Well, it absolutely is, and our president stood up and, and addressed MS-13 uh, and um, you might recall, refer to them as animals. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, Nancy Pelosi spoke up and, and said something to the effect uh, that that was very crude because every person has a spark of divinity within them. Well, I hate to disagree with Ms. Pelosi, but no, I'm sorry, MS-13 members who chop people up with machetes and rape little girls, sorry, Nancy, they do not have any spark of divinity within them. Yes. Yes, that yeah, that's what I, that's what I'm talking about. It's just amazing how people would come to the defense of, of groups like this and people that are just so vicious and so violent. And uh, you know, it, it makes it that much easier, I think, when you have opposition in our own country that are that are standing up for people like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't understand that, but you know, that's a political thing, and I'm sure there's political angles to it. But it just doesn't make any sense to me. And, and we see that, you know, with so much of the, this epidemic with opiates and, and just drugs in general, you know, what's going on in Chicago and the violence. And, you know, it really it's a direct uh, reflection of, of the borders and, and how and not to mention the terrorist aspect of it. You know, I mean, how, how many people are coming in that are looking to do people harm from other countries? I mean, it's an open door, really. I mean, it's starting to get secure. But it's very difficult to do when you have so much opposition against it. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then we, uh, Anthony, also have the cost aspect right. that people don't stop to think about. We have to pay our own taxes. If a person legally in this country 
Uh, commits a crime, a public defender is appointed if they have no money for a lawyer. Uh, we have to take care of those people who are lawfully here, but now we're, we're adding to that. We're, we're, uh, some of us are suggesting that these people need to come into this country. We're going to provide, for example, the, the one that came in the other day that's been the subject of much press. Uh, we're going to be paying for that, uh, for those attorneys. We're going to be paying for all those appeals. If this person needs a liver transplant, we're going to be paying for that. We're going to be paying for his dental and his food. We're going to be paying for all that, mm -hmm. okay, in yeah. addition to paying for our own people and our own taxes. So for those people who want to just keep bringing those people in, they're not only burdening uh, us as adults, they're, they're putting these taxes on the backs of our children. Right. Uh, and, and so that's something I hope at some point people will stop and think about. Yes, well said, well said, thank you. Shifting gears a little bit with something a little bit hopefully more positive, uh, with your what you're doing currently as a uh, a professor and teaching students, you know, it, it's it's some dark times and we're talking about a lot of very negative things and and they're going to be, you know, kind of engulfed with negativity as a prosecutor and seeing all of these different crimes and pain and suffering. I'm sure that takes a toll on you to to have to deal with people that have gone through so much tragedy and things. So how do you, when you're, when you're teaching, you know, now and things like that, and you have these young students and they're so excited about going into this field and everything, and, and then it's kind of like cold water thrown on them with some, you know, what's really going out, on out there in the world. How do you encourage them or provide any, anything that's really going to make them say, yeah, I still want to do this and this is what, I want this to be my career? Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes uh, criminal justice students do seem to get a bit discouraged. Um, I try to encourage them by letting them know uh, that their training and their education and their experience is going to someday help people, going to be helpful to victims, crime victims, and, and crime victims do need help. Um, uh, there are times when they get a little discouraged because, as you suggest, most of the news is bad news. Um, where I've particularly found um, issues is uh, when we've been having classes uh, and uh, we go into great detail about sexual abuse of children. Yeah. Uh, that's when I find the class is getting more and more depressed. Uh, while they um, uh, don't like uh, crimes committed against adults, it's particularly um, uh, burdensome mentally to think about small children. Uh, and then you have some of these criminals who go into great detail with no problem at all uh, about the acts they've committed against little children. And so that's when I find the students getting depressed uh, and the only thing I say to them when I sit and I see the long faces sometimes in the audience, you know, I tell them this is not going to be good news. This is not cake decorating class. This right. is not interior design class. You, you knew this and you signed up for this and you can make a difference in the world by mm. studying this. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, because I'm sure there's some people that just kind of drop out of it when, when you start getting in those areas. But then I'm sure there's other people that kind of rise to the challenge and be like, you know what, this is horrendous. And I'm going to make a difference, and I'm going to do something about this, and really excel mm -hmm. in that type of career. Mm -hmm. I mean, you definitely would have to have a lot of heart and, and a lot of courage and a lot of toughness, I would think. I mean, I'm watching these things. Like I said, I, I mean, I basically get get my insight from from 48 hours and things like that. But just what, what what's interesting? I was watching this thing on Netflix the other night, and it was about a guy that wanted to be on death row, and he was in solitary confinement for so long, which is Pretty much every study I've seen make, seems to make people worse, but it, it, there's still people using punish, that for punishment and, and you know, corrections, uh, people using that for punishment, I guess. But he ended up killing somebody in the prison so he could go on death row. And that was what the whole thing was about. But I thought it was interesting because they kept showing like the prosecutors and the defense attorneys and things like at their house and in their neighborhood. And it was part of the show. But I was thinking, I would, I would definitely not want anyone to know anywhere, even the, the city that I live or state or whatever, if I was prosecuting these, you know, horrible criminals and things like that. So has, has there ever been anything like that you were involved in? What maybe you were like fearful or wondering about retaliation or threats or, because uh, I would think that would be something that would would go on with with this because these people must really focus on a prosecutor. And look at well, but you're my life's in their hands, and they're coming up with this stuff. And maybe if they don't believe it's true or whatever, how does how does that? What's your take on that as far as 
you know, have you ever ever had situations like that that you were kind of a little bit worried or afraid or been threatened and things like that? Well, as a prosecuting attorney, I recall having a jury trial and the jury came back guilty. Uh, and, and the case was a, a difficult case because both the victim and the defendant were drug dealers. Those kinds of cases is, for prosecutors are kind of hard to prove right. because the defense will always float the notion uh, that this was just a drug deal gone bad and mm -hmm. you're certainly not going to prosecute one of these drug dealings. Uh, but uh, that particular defendant um, had gotten away on two or three trials, all not guilties, and all of a sudden our trial came uh, and the jury came back guilty. And I recall him being led away and as he was being led away by the bailiffs, he looked back at me and said, you haven't seen the last of this, I will say, expletive mm. uh, yet, okay? Uh, I was concerned, I mentioned that to, to the uh, defense attorney, and the defense attorney said to me at the time, don't be concerned because he's also threatened me. Uh, <laughs> so, so I guess he just had a habit of threatening people when sure. things didn't turn out right. the way he wanted them to turn right. out. Right, so. yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, interesting, very interesting, because I, I worked in Manhattan for about six and a half years. I was mm -hmm. telling you uh, when we weren't on the air, working with Dr. Park Dietz, uh, the threat assessment program that he has. Mm -hmm. And we were, our job as the regional director of security, and I used to be with the regional director of, of human resources, and we'd have to assess threats. And a lot of times in New York City areas, when someone made a threat, they almost were obligated to follow through with it because then their respect and their, their credibility and everything just kind of falls apart. So. Uh, but I was just interested and curious about that as far as from the uh, criminal justice standpoint. Uh, they're, maybe they're less likely to do it because they're looking at more charges and things like that. But uh, we got about a minute left. I just wanted to ask you uh, quickly as far as uh, what could you uh, tell someone listening who was a victim of a violent crime? What could you say to encourage them or give them some hope? Maybe they're in the process right now. Maybe they're in the court system right now. Maybe it's a loved one that they're dealing with. What could you say to them from that perspective? Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I would say to a crime victim is to pursue your rights yourself. Don't depend on the police always uh, being engaged in your case. Uh, don't uh, believe that every police officer is going to work hard for you. Don't believe that every prosecutor is going to work hard for you. Understand that you are the person who is most interested in your case. Mm. Do research, uh, keep an eye out, watch the prosecutors, watch the police, watch the courts. Be very, very engaged in your own case to promote your case. Um, now, if you are a victim who um, the police have told, uh, you know, perhaps your case is not that great. We're not going to pursue your case. Right. If you know you've been victimized, don't let it stop at that. Hmm. Keep promoting your case. Yes. Um, because, like I say, we have loads and loads of crime victims, but uh, crime victims in recent years have been given rights, okay? Right. Uh, crime victims in recent years have been given compensation for their crimes, so they need to apply to the victim fund uh, where they might get some compensation. Uh, to assist them yeah. as being a crime victim. So they need to, each person needs to stand up for himself yeah. or herself and not depend on anybody else to carry the weight for you. Right. You be your own best cheerleader. That's, a, that's great advice. Be, you have to advocate for yourself. Absolutely. You have to be assertive. You have to do your due diligence. And don't just, you know, I'm sure there's people that are involved with crime and things or something happens to them. And it's like, well, that's their job. The prosecutor will do it. The, the yeah. attorney will do it. But it's really, like you said, the, the vested interest is mostly in that person. It's not It's not necessarily the, the legal team. Interesting, any, uh, if you could tell us any ways that people uh, could follow you, if you if you would like, because I know we just said you wouldn't want, want that maybe as a prosecutor, but if there's any uh, social media or any ways people could follow your work or connect with you, uh, if you could, if you could uh, share that with us. Uh, I, I just, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, get closing here. Uh, if you or someone you know is in need of substance abuse treatment, contact us at 888-270-5712, or you can reach us online, faithandrecovery.com or banyantreatmentcenter.com, or if you have questions about the show or anything, and any of the shows that we've had, all of our shows are on faithandrecovery.com if you just go to media and radio shows 
you could contact 201-538-2754. So thank you so much, Doctor, for uh, sharing, Melaine, for coming on, and that information now for, uh, for following you or contacting you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so on LinkedIn, uh, people uh, could follow me at drlawyermelaine.com. Again, that's drlawyermelaine.com. On Twitter, they could follow me at Dr. Lawyer SGM. Again, at Twitter, at Dr. Lawyer SGM. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We are so blessed to have you here and get the insights that you have. So much experience. Thank you again. Thank you for joining us. Psalm 147.3 heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Thank you and God bless you.